Okay, I think we're live. You've got Mel with a wonderful guest, whom I'll see in just a moment. Laura Vanna. How did I get your name this time? Almost correct. <laughs> Want to pronounce it for, for the audience? Yes, uh, so I call myself Laura Vanna. <laughs> so Laura you were almost. Vanna. Yes. <laughs> okay, and I, I'm, I'm thinking you might be, you might be my first guest from Estonia. Hmm. That's weird. You know a lot of Estonian people, though, don't you? I know, but you know most <laughs> of them are camera shy, and you aren't. So uh, we we start out with the jingle. Okay. Because it's part of the show. I spent <laughs> a lot of money making it. So let's have a go at it, right? Okay. <laughs> we don't have much choice, you know. What should I do? <laughs> you should just uh, smile, clap your hands, and be very happy. Okay. Ah, one second. I didn't do the... Uh, I know what I did wrong. Okay, we'll just play it. You got, got Mel. Mel. And oh, that's enough. One time is enough. <laughs> and you got Mel has Laura Vanna. <laughs> Perfect. Getting better? Yes. Okay. So it's wonderful to see you. I haven't seen you in quite a while. Yep. In these Corona days. Mm. And you're looking good. Uh, Thank you. And you are uh, an amazing human being, but you're also a foodie and a food expert. An international food expert. Um, <laughs> so start with your childhood, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's your show, Laura. Mm. I just ask you questions once yeah. in a while. Sure. So my childhood. Well, I don't think I was a foodie before, maybe my high school years. So and how I got there was that um, I was actually a professional athlete and. Um, uh, at one point, I like I start, had to start to like look what I'm I'm putting in my body uh, to be able to train a hundred percent. And uh, one second, sport for me means playing chess. You have to. Uh, <laughs> so I played badminton, <laughs> uh, and uh, actually since 14 to 26, I was uh, doing it professionally. So. Uh, I was traveling the world and uh, you were also you, you were also the number one badminton player in Estonia. Uh, at, at some point I was, yes. Yeah. Um, that, that's, a I feather, was... that's a feather in your cap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think my highest world ranking in women's singles was top hundred. So that was uh, quite quite a nice achievement for me. Uh, but yeah, so I, I had to start cooking for myself and, uh, and I started to yeah, look up uh, recipes online and that's why like, I started to really enjoy uh, cooking. And, uh, and as I was traveling a lot, um, I, I had the chance to also explore other uh, cuisines all, all over the world. And I think it just kind of grew, grew on me. And um, I come from a home uh, which uh, values education uh, very very highly and uh, I know you, I know your mom is a high school principal I, <laughs> I talked to her I was very polite <laughs> and um, like uh, my parents were okay you can do sports but uh, like after you graduate from high school you also have to go to a university because otherwise uh, like uh, they won't uh, sponsor my sport so um uh, for me, actually, it wasn't um, uh, it was a no brainer what to go and study because I was quite good in chemistry. I, lo I love chemistry and I love food. So um, I went to study food technology. And, uh, and yeah, uh, I mean, during the time I did my bachelor, I wasn't uh, attending school that much because I was living in uh, 
in Sweden and uh, like all over the world uh, most of the time in either in trading camps or um, or uh, at tournaments. But uh, but I graduated from it and then I actually moved to Denmark, which is a foodie paradise, right? <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, I had a chance to play badminton in Denmark, but also go to Copenhagen University, which is uh, known for, uh, for their very strong, um, like culinary science, uh, like a strong uh, science field. Yeah. And they actually also, at the time I went there, they had uh, the Nordic Food Lab uh in the same building as the university and uh uh um, i think i must explain what nordic food lab is it's uh, it started out as uh it's, Noma it sounds like a giant it sounds like a giant refrigerator <laughs> well it basically is a, a giant refrigerator full of uh, funky things um but uh, it started out i think in 2010 as uh, nomas with noma is like one of the world's best restaurants in copenhagen by Rene Recepi, but it started out as uh, Rene's like uh, secret food lab, uh, which uh, where he started to collaborate with uh, scientists from uh, Copenhagen University. And uh, at one point, um, it became an institution on its own. So it grew, started from the restaurant, but it grew um, uh, until it was a part of the university actually. And um, we had classes with uh, the head chef, uh, of uh, Nordic Food Lab, which at the time was uh, Roberta Fiora, who's a good friend of uh, Tamas. <laughs> oh, you know him too, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I had the chance to, to also uh, study uh, under Roberto, which, which was an amazing experience. I mean, at the time he was uh, researching insects. So we had, we could try quite a lot of his insect dishes. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll pass on that one, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, what, what, what kind? What kind of insect? I food for insects or people eating insects? Uh, people eating insects. So he was uh, researching uh, insects as a potential like source of protein. What kind of insects? Uh, crickets mostly. Uh, but he was also making uh, different experiments with bee larvae. Mm -hmm. So you, you've eaten crickets. Yes, and also bee larvae. And bee it's larvae. Delicious. Yeah. Which, it's... which do you prefer? What's your favorite uh, insect dish, Laura? Um, I can't say. <laughs> because I they're mean, all so good. They're all so good. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, crickets uh, on, on its own, so how, how uh, like you would freeze dry them and then make flour out, out of it. Uh, when like you, you try to ingest the freeze-dried one, they like their, what's their, like it called, they uh, screech your uh, throat, so they're not that- because, Of course, because they're trying to fly out. <laughs> well, they're dead by that time, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the, like you can make cookies and uh, stuff like that out, out of their flour. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you don't have anything else, I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until this show, I thought that I would, the next time we meet, you would cook me something. Yeah. But I no. just decided to pass on that. <laughs> no, Hi, Mel, is... have some of my cricket cookies. <laughs> well, I won't tell you that there's crickets inside until That's you've ingested them. That worries me even more, Laura. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so you actually have a master's degree in food. Yes. Yeah, in uh, food innovation and health. And then, and then, and then you became a speaker at our at our TEDx last year at the two years ago. Wow, yeah. at the uh, Shankar College. How did how did that happen? <laughs> so actually, before I uh, so when I graduated from uh, from university, I um, uh, I did not uh, like I I knew that I didn't want to uh, want want to follow the the normal path. Uh, that you would do when you graduate like from uh, from uh, food science so that would be going to be a product developer in somewhere in some big corporation uh, so I kind of uh, uh, took some years off uh, I was still um, uh, doing like sensory education uh, camps and classes but I, I actually worked in tech 
for a couple of years. I, I started as a sales intern and I ended up being an account executive in uh, one HR tech startup in Estonia. And that's actually where I also meet, met all our lovely um, uh, friends in Estonia <laughs> uh, who, who uh, we both know. Uh, but yeah, in uh, uh, getting to the topic of, uh, of um, of children and food, uh, I, I like. One I second, found... Laura. We so this is a good time to say that we met at Kinernet, mm -hmm. like many of my wonderful mm -hmm. interviewees. Yes. So uh, we thank uh, Yossi Vardi and yes. our our friends in the Nordic countries for bringing us together. Important. Absolutely, very important. Uh, I met a lot of lovely people in uh, in the Kinernet. Um, including you, Mel. <laughs> um, and we had a very uh, fun drive back from, uh, from the manor. <laughs> uh, yeah. What happened? What happened? Uh, what happened? Well, you, you invited, did. yeah. You took us to the airport. I, uh, yeah, I took <laughs> you to the airport. Uh, we called my mom. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we listened to uh, good music. Um, yeah, and, uh, we discussed, uh, what should I, uh, uh, what should I, uh, talk about in my TED right. talk? Here's the, here's the part that you don't know. So you impressed us at Kiner Nord, Kiner Nord, uh, which is the Kiner net of Nordic countries. And, um, you had that, um, session feeding us all kinds of strange foods and altering our taste buds, uh, which was wonderful. And um, then you volunteered to take uh, Alona Meat and me to the airport. And we had like two hours. There was also a, um, a storm or a fog or something, yeah. I can remember. And, um, and we had a long talk. And what you don't know is at some point I turned to Alon and he turned to me. And we said in Hebrew, we need this lady <laughs> at our tech. <laughs> she gave a great talk, and it, it shows the power of meeting people and networking. Yeah, totally. Just by being you, just by being you, you got on the international stage. wasn't anticipated, mm -hmm. and if you didn't volunteer to take us to the airport, nothing would have happened. Yeah. Yeah, and, and actually I volunteered to take you to the airport already before I met you, because uh, Rina had asked me, because she, she know that I was going back the, the same night. So oh, I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't Thank know. You, Rina. <laughs> so I didn't know who I was taking. <laughs> I didn't uh, Google you before. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, I like life is full of uh, these happy coincidences. But no, it, but it's important for young people to understand that opportunities can happen anywhere if you yeah. volunteer. Yeah. If you reach out, if you if you do a good deed for someone. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you became one of our most interesting speakers. <laughs> what was Thank the subject, you. Laura? So uh, the subject was uh, kids play with their food. <laughs> and I'm playing with food here today as well. I have so, uh, mushrooms oh. as earrings. <laughs> that, you promised me broccoli. Well, and, um, I was wondering, like the whole interview, what are those things? So these are mushroom earrings. Go these ahead. are mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had a problem with broccoli. I thought I have some uh, in the freezer, but I didn't. <laughs> so these I are, used these to... are even, they're better and they become you. Yeah. <laughs> so many people have fungus in their ears and you've taken this to a whole new level. Yeah. They're not growing out of my, my ears. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but uh, but the topic of uh, of uh, food and kids and uh, sensory education um, has been with me since uh, I went to study in Copenhagen. Uh, I was like I first did a research paper on uh, food neophobia, which is basically the fear of uh, uh, ingesting uh, novel foods, foods that are unknown to us. And the fear is based on the uh, on, on on that that we are afraid that it's uh, poisonous to us, could kill us, or it just tastes really really bad, or make 
could make uh, or it could make us sick. Or or, n or not kosher and containing insect flour. Oh, that can <laughs> that can also be uh, one cause. I mean, anything that uh, would that you think would make uh, a reaction in your body, uh, actually a physical reaction. Um, and uh, food phobia is a bit different than uh, picky eating because picky eaters like. Uh, don't eat foods that are very common, like um, tomatoes or, yeah, broccoli also. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I was researching uh, ways how uh, you could help uh, children uh, overcome this fear. And uh, if there are any techniques already developed uh, that parents or teachers could use to... Uh, uh, to make children try uh, different foods. And, uh, and from there, I had the opportunity to join a research group in uh, Denmark uh, called Taste for Life or Sme for Livet for Dansk in Danish. Uh, and, uh, and I got funding to do a sensory education camp here in uh, Tallinn where I had a class uh, of uh, sixth graders uh, who were also actually, uh, the class was from a Russian speaking uh, school. Uh, so it was also a challenge for me. I mean, they had been, they were all from Russian families, but they had been studying Estonian for, for some years. Uh, so for them, it was, they also had to uh, communicate in Estonian and I had to, sometimes try to explain it in Russian. So the sensory education camp was also a, a challenge for me language wise. But uh, I took them for a week. Uh, we were cooking together from novel ingredients and also doing some different sensory uh, exercises. The same that uh, also we did with uh, you in Kindernord, where you color your tongue blue and uh, try to count all of your taste buds and uh and just uh, cover the topics uh so of like uh, basic taste and what's the difference between flavor and taste and so on so um the children uh could become more aware of of actually what's happening you know when they are eating that uh, it's not only yum or yuck uh, so that it's not only based on uh like hedonic hedonic uh, values but actually try to more pay attention to like what does it actually taste like what sound does it make you know when you put it in your mouth and but and bite it what what does it smell like uh like when you touch it how does it feel and so on um so it's not only about food but it the whole experience incredible so i'm thinking now while you're talking that we have to write a children's book together <laughs> So you came out with this crazy idea that what? Then what? Um, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that children should. Uh, that children uh, should play with their food. <laughs> right, w w yeah. which, every, which every Jewish mother is going to go crazy. And also Estonian mothers, right? Yeah. What's the story yeah. here? How were you as a kid? Yeah, so I was also, I would say I was a picky kid, uh, maybe a slightly xenophobic. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so I think the worst uh, that parents could do is actually force their children to um, eat something they don't like or, uh, or then like control them too much. So uh, control them uh, uh, to behave with the food in a way that they think is like normal. And uh, I think what's the, what, what, what is really, it's not a funny thing, but thing that we, we all do, uh, we, we, we try to control uh, people around us without actually thinking like why we are doing it. So, so when um, like your child is playing with your, playing with their food, uh, you say, don't play with it. Food is not for playing, but why are you saying that? And are you thinking uh, like what, uh, what might it do to our, to our child like? Uh, but, but there, there's a good reason that people from Estonia would have 
this idea that food is holy yeah and it should be revered yeah why is that i mean it, it comes from our history uh because we um uh, estonians uh, we have been under the soviet uh, rule for a long time and my parents also come from that era and and everything was scarce uh, back then not only food i mean everything clothes and everything you had to stand in line for to get anything and like eating bananas it's a new thing <laughs> it's uh uh like from from the middle of 90s we we got bananas <laughs> in estonia so you so we probably comes from... thought it, was, it belonged to a telephone or something <laughs> um or, or a toy <laughs> so, so you say this whole tradition of of hundreds of years of of occupation and the russians and before that the nazis germans before yeah that, the uh, first Sweet. world war <laughs> exactly Danish. so um and, and and you want to break this thousand year tradition and teach children that food is what a commodity a game um i would like uh children to explore it so um it doesn't have to be a game but it doesn't have to be something that you strictly control so um when a child doesn't want to eat something um i think it's okay uh don't push them but maybe just try to um help them to discover it so they don't have to put it in their mouth but maybe have them look look at it and try to even make them describe it if they're that old that they uh they have the linguistic capabilities of uh of doing that and uh i think it's all about getting familiar uh with uh with the food item so uh of course it's it, it's innate that uh that you don't put the a foreign thing in your mouth right the foreign thing could kill you or make you ill it it comes from uh i mean from we were still hunter gatherers and uh and from the uh from from omnivore's dilemma uh which means that uh it, like we need to constantly search for for a varied diet but also everything new you know could harm us could kill us so um so it, it all comes from there but we are not hunter gatherers anymore and the food that we have in our house <laughs> hopefully won't make us ill because <laughs> we have refri refrigerators and uh and uh, grocery stores and and uh the fda is like making sure that <laughs> the food that we can purchase is uh is good for us so so at this point i think we should just be more open uh ourselves and let our kids be have an open mind uh, and just food. let them play with food yeah let them play with food let them explore because the thing is that uh when you control your uh child or control your children when they are growing up um they might grow up to become adults with uh like eating disorders no. uh, i mean food phobia is also an eating disorder because you you most likely will eat only certain uh like foods that are very common for you like there ha there are cases of adults that i know who you know only eat like cereal white bread with uh, peanut butter and like uh, macaroni with cheese like that's i mean these are all good things don't get me wrong but like for, for the protein and vitamins <laughs> but uh, they don't eat anything else so they they don't have a a var varied diet and uh in long term that's not good yeah laura in your talk uh which i love you apologize to your mother oh what was that all about oh and my mom was i wasn't very happy uh <laughs> she wasn't very happy no. you apologized to her and she wasn't yeah, happy no but but she was she wasn't very happy that i would <laughs> that i talked about that so um so i was telling a story that um when i was little uh, i remember that uh, my mom loved to make this chicken and dumpling soup uh, where she also included like boiled vegetables and there were like carrots broccoli and parsnip and um for me the taste of boiled carrots was absolutely vile i just like when she, she actually like i couldn't leave the table <laughs> before 
the plate was cleared because I mean that was what she had grown up with like everyone had to finish their plates and then you know you could go uh, so um, and it was every time I remember we had this soup I had to think of like creative ways of to get rid of the vegetables so I remember I was hiding them in my pockets uh, in my dress pockets and throwing them under the table to <laughs> to finally uh, get away from the table did, did you have a rabbit or somebody to take care of it or we didn't I don't know what happened to them <laughs> well, if you had a ha if you had a rabbit it could have come out nice in the end you know? yeah or even a dog or a cat. I mean, I have a cat at the moment who eats anything, even breadcrumbs. So <laughs> because, that, was... because that, that's your cat. <laughs> um, I'm not sure the dogs love carrots. Uh, it depends, I think, what they're used to. <laughs> dogs can also be neophobes, you know? Yeah, ha I haven't I, I, uh, researched I'm, I'm, I'm just, that, but I'm just guessing. Yeah, this is this is all going to go into our children's book together. <laughs> I, ho I hope you realize that we're going to write a children's book together. <laughs> well, OK, <laughs> this is another. Uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> why? Why the hell not? That was the same uh, reaction when uh, you asked me to um, do the TED talk. <laughs> yeah, you, why you the hell not? At, at the beginning, you know, you have this thing like you say, oh, oh hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. And that's your neophobe. Mm -hmm. Laura, and then you say, yeah. okay, what's going on? What's yeah. going on in your mind? Uh, yeah, um, I should, I should um, uh, do as I say, uh, or uh, so uh, I, I now act as uh, knowing is doing, and I say yes. <laughs> yeah. So like you have a shy side of you, but you, uh, get, on, you get on the stage. Yeah, uh, I have a shy side, but then I also have this rational and what's the worst thing that can happen side. And, uh, and yeah, I, I try to um, put, my, put myself in uh, uncomfortable positions uh, uh, or like in, yeah, face my fears, so to say. Uh, so, um, so yeah, why the hell not? Okay, so so um, you know what the worst thing that can happen to you in this interview? Is um, my asking you your favorite Beatles song? Uh, Yellow Submarine. <laughs> okay, that's the first part. <laughs> what am I going to ask you to do now? Sing it with you. <laughs> even, even even worse. Um, sing, it, sing it without me. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you three minutes to. <laughs> have this discussion in your brain you know? <laughs> we both know at the end you're going to sing i still need lyrics and please sing with me <laughs> yeah but there's a, a delay you know there's a um a latency here our friends who invented voice over ip haven't figured out the latency yet hmm. so there's a half a second difference okay so you start <laughs> With the half a second. Okay. <laughs> In the town. Oh, we don't get lyrics. <laughs> it's not karaoke. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I need to get lyrics then because I don't know it fully by heart. <laughs> no, but just, pre just pretend. <laughs> okay. In the town where we belong. <laughs> Continue. The man who sailed the sea. <laughs> <laughs> and he told us of his mm -hmm. <laughs> in a uh, of submarine. <laughs> we all live in the yellow submarine. <laughs> uh, yellow submarine. Yellow uh, submarine. <laughs> Laura, you're amazing. My, my 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 last question for you today is to go back to your your sports career. <clears throat> okay. What what makes an incredible athlete? You were like a very motivated, uh, world class badminton player. What's mm. the secret? What's the secret? I think there's no secret. It's only hard work. 
um, discipline, hard work. Um, you know, uh, knowing how to lose, I think, is also uh, uh, and and learning from your losses uh, is also what makes a great athlete. Really? Because you grow. Oh, I think you only grow uh, when you learn from your losses. Um, really? I, I, because you said now to learn from your losses. And I heard now an interview with a soccer player. Okay. okay. A, very, a very famous one um, who uh, said that he hates to lose. Mm -hmm. And here you're saying that it's okay to lose. Well, I mean, you need to, you need to hate to lose to be a great athlete, but you also can't be afraid to lose. Ah, okay. The guy's name was Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't know mm -hmm. whether you know him. Yeah, um, I've heard. So you hate to lose, but you're not afraid to lose? Yeah. How does I that think, work? Um, and I mean, I, I, I work with that a lot because uh, at one point, um, I, I was really afraid to lose, cause especially when when the only thing that I did was play badminton, like I had put all my cards on, uh, on one number, <laughs> basically. And, uh, and let, when, when you are afraid to lose, I think it kind of paralyzes you and you can't, uh, perform your best because you are controlling or like, you're not letting yourself go or like letting yourself be free because you have this, you have fear. And uh, I mean, fear is not good uh, when you want to perform. Okay. Do you have to believe that you're going to win? Um, I, I think, yes, of course, you have to believe in yourself. But I, for me, I, I realized the key was to uh, like play one point at a time. Like yes, just yes, yeah, yes, yes. focus on like on the now uh, and like take it take it from there this yeah. is what i teach my entrepreneurship classes to be like a tennis player <laughs> which is like badminton yeah basically <laughs> but faster Incre incredible <laughs> laura that was incredible <laughs> thank you <laughs> is there anything i haven't asked you um No, yeah, what, what, yeah, where, where, where is you, you have a new job, two months into a new job. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, back, back when, uh, back in May, when I was, uh, when we did the TED talk, I was still with, uh, uh, the restaurant group. I think I also had a very cool job. I was uh, the head of uh, research and development in the best, uh, restaurant group here in Estonia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I mean, the, the COVID uh, uh, situation was very hard on, on the hospitality industry in a whole. So, um, so I took the summer off and, uh, and just enjoyed life for, for a change uh, and enjoyed the summer. And then uh, for now for two months, I am the, a brand advocacy manager in uh, one hospitality tech company. And basically my job there is to take the experience from the tech world and from the hospitality world and uh, make sure that our branding, our tone of voice, everything that goes out is, is the way how hospitality people get it. So that's, you know, we fully live our slogan that is for hospitality by hospitality. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so you're trying to get people to buy what? Broccoli? Mm -hmm. No, uh, to buy software. <laughs> ah, to buy software. What yeah. kind of software? It's, um, so we have actually uh, three different businesses. Uh, our bread and butter uh, is a human workforce uh, management system. It's one of the smartest systems in the world. It's uh, uh, sales optimized uh, schedules. So you basically take into account, uh, like, uh, what's the what 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 are the historical sales numbers? Like, uh, at, at what time? Like, there's a lot of people in your restaurant. Uh, at what time there's isn't that many, and it like makes the schedule for you. 
uh, which is sales optimized. Then we have a learning management system for hospitality businesses. So you can do online training for like your restaurant, for your hotel, from, you know, starting from compliance training to training, like to blending the classroom trainings, for example, for- But Laura, all of your customers are going bankrupt. How did you get a job <laughs> in the hospitality uh, uh, yeah, area? So so actually, uh, for for our biggest friends are uh, from Nepal. Uh, our main customers are huge chains: uh -huh. uh, Five Guys, Starbucks, uh, Burger King, and so ah, on. Ah, okay. They so you're, are. You're, you're giving Starbucks uh, analytical data on how to do a better job of burning my coffee. <laughs> uh, not yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's, just, let's just call it what it is. Yeah, I, and I totally agree with you. Um, I don't know what's the hype about, but they are very nice to their people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean Starbucks is a great place to sit and hang out. Yeah, and um, they are a very good employer as well. So I've heard. Yes, um, and they are, uh, but the food. The yeah. quality, the the um, the health. Yeah, you know, you go into a Starbucks, and between you and me, there there's no broccoli, there's no carrots. No. Um, the healthiest food there is is sweet yogurt. Yeah, I'm just, I'm black, black, black coffee, green tea. And actually, they have one product. They have oatmeal porridge, mm. which is which is rather healthy. Yeah. But that's by accident. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't know that it's in the inventory. I always order, I say, can I have some porridge? And they say, what's that? Oh, you mean oatmeal. And then they go and get, I, are you sure you want that? Why don't you have one of these delicious cinnamon buns, 650 calories? Do you take syrup and uh, whipped cream with your porridge? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> but a little brown sugar. Yeah. Uh, but... <laughs> But uh, but yeah, the we uh, we got a huge investment from um, from a U.S. Uh, investment fund uh, just before COVID hit uh, to actually acquire um, a couple of other uh, hospitality tech businesses to create like this uh, all-in-one platform for like a restaurant, so you can get all the tech that you need from uh, from one place. So we are in midst of acquiring a couple of other uh, businesses and and one of my responsibilities there is actually also to to bring all of these different brands under under one one brand so really interesting and something that I haven't done before I'm learning a lot and uh, and I'm actually quite happy to be back in tech but now um, but still with one leg in the hospitality industry, which I like fully love. But, but the times are like that, that uh, uh, with my background, it's quite hard to, you know, find anything in, um, in hospitality because I- Laura, mean, listen, I, I know you, you can find a job anywhere. <laughs> um, are, are you in Tallinn now? Where are you? Yeah, I'm in Tallinn. And working mostly from, the, from your home? Yeah, uh, the marketing team is fully remote. Uh, mm -hmm. Our headquarters is in uh, in Madrid, and another big office in Edinburgh. I hope uh, soon we, I can also travel to meet my team there. But uh, that would be wonderful. But, um, Edinburgh yeah. is great. So um, now I know why you're not wearing any broccoli jewelry because you don't have any broccoli in your house, <laughs> and you don't have any carrots in your house either. No. <laughs> uh, so your homework <laughs> for the next time. Um, anyway, listen, it's, it's been great to have you on You've Got Mail. Uh, and um, keep your wonderful initiative and spirit. Uh, you're a person who will succeed at whatever you choose to do. <laughs> Thank you, Mel. <laughs> and uh, that is why we're going to write a children's book together. Okay, it's a deal. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm not coercing you. Yeah. It's because you can say no. Yeah, no, but I think... I think uh, we can do a great job. I think so. Yeah. Did we ever talk about this before? No, we haven't. And I think uh, uh, this is a challenge 
like I see this as a challenge for myself because I don't think of myself as a very creative like person <laughs> you're hilarious <laughs> so so yeah that's uh I, like I can prove myself that then <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah it's, it's like it's all like singing yellow submarine isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. without without remembering the words yeah. I need to look it up online <laughs> Laura Vanna my my international food specialist and wonderful young lady I can't wait until we meet again <laughs> me too thank you Mel <laughs> my dear mm -hmm.